As far as, you know, being worried about which topics you can take on, I think there's definitely going to be a lot of people who are comedians who are scared to do that. I think more than anything, I wish that we could at least get back to a time where if you were offended by a joke, if you were offended by the mere presence of a comedian, you don't go and check them out. And, you know, to even further than that, you don't try to make sure that no one is ever allowed to go and see them again. I think if we can get back to that, I think that would be a really good thing for comedy overall. Hello, welcome back to the Brendan O'Neill Show with me, Brendan O'Neill, and my special guest this week, Lou Perez. Lou, welcome to the show. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. We've had many chats in real life, in bars and other places, so I thought we should record one of them for posterity so that people can hear what we talk about when we talk about stuff. Yeah, and, and possibly get in trouble for it. Yeah. You know? So all that Ideally. other stuff, it's just that's in the dustbin of history, but now <laughs> we're going to be recorded. So Absolutely. And uh, what I want to talk to you about, of course, is comedy. You are a libertarian comedian. We can dig into that and what that means and what that involves. Uh, but I want to talk to you primarily about your excellent new book, which I highly recommend to listeners, which is called That Joke Isn't Funny Anymore, on the death and rebirth of comedy. And it covers so much ground. There's so much to talk about. To kick us off, I want, I want to talk about where comedy is at right now and how grave the threat to comedy is in your view. So while we're talking, a very well-known comedian here in the UK, Jerry Sadovitz, has been uh, essentially banned from the Edinburgh Fringe Festival for being offensive. So the Edinburgh Fringe is not quite as fringe as people thought. Of course, there is the lingering Dave Chappelle controversies where he's always getting in trouble for telling jokes about trans people and other marginalized groups. And then there have been controversy, controversies which you write about really well in the book to do with who is allowed to perform certain characters. So we have characters from Family Guy, from The Simpsons, either being cancelled or rewritten because they are inappropriate, offensive, and so on. So there's loads of that stuff I want to talk to you about. But given this background, how grave do you think the, the woke threat to comedy is right now? Well, when you put it like that, it seems like uh, we only have a few more days left of it. You know, one thing that I try to do with my book, uh, in addition to, you know, pointing out examples like that, is also to bring some hope. And I, and yeah. I think it's hope that's actually grounded in reality. And I think we live in such amazing times where you can have all of this terrible stuff happening in comedy, people being uh, kicked off of shows and, and silenced. But then you also have just this magnificent opportunity that technology has given us to broadcast yourself and to get yourself out there. So something that, that I would say is, you know, if you look at what's happening in late night comedy, in mainstream comedy, uh, it's something to worry about, you know, but fortunately comedians like myself and others are able to get on the mic and get our stuff out there like never before. And what I thought was was really uh, interesting because I I, I looked a, a little bit at the uh, at what happened with the the Edinburgh uh, Festival, and when that comedian was you know canceled, there were others who jumped in and said, "Hey, you have a spot uh, anytime you like on my stage." And I think that's so important too, where you can't just sit back and be a passive either a passive uh, entertainer or a passive audience member. You have to get in there and show that you support what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. And that hopefulness comes through uh, not only in the book itself, but also in the work that you've been doing online, on the internet, you and many others in terms of circumventing the old guardians of comedy, I guess, who increasingly tell us that there are right ways to be funny and wrong ways to be funny and get your material out there yourself. And I think that DIY approach to comedy is incredibly important. We can talk about that a bit later in terms of the more positive elements about how people are pushing back against this attempt, this <laughs> rather bizarre attempt to determine uh, what one is allowed to say in, in a comedic situation. But just to um, get into some of the problems with 
mainstream comedy as it currently exists. One of the things I found fascinating in your book, early on in the book, you talk a lot about shows like Saturday Night Live and about what happened to comedy during the Obama era and then the Trump era. So in the Trump era, you have all these comedians who are suddenly saying, we've got to speak truth to power, as if that's the role of a comedian to you know hold people to account in that kind of old fashioned political way. But a lot of those people didn't say things like that during the Obama era, which they see as this kind of blemish free eight year presidency, which was just perfect. He never put a foot wrong. He never did a bad thing. Is that how politicized comedy has become in the United States, where you can have an eight year long presidency and comedians who pose as these great warriors for truth kind of hold back in terms of what they say about the president, what they say about the administration? Yeah, I, I, I believe so. And you know, something that happened, I, I noticed around, um, well, it was 2016 when Donald Trump won the election, I saw a number of think pieces asking the, you know, the all important question, what is the role of comedy <laughs> under Donald Trump? And you, I, I see that question and I think, well, shouldn't it be the same role that it played under Obama, under Bush, under Clinton, you know, and uh, what was obvious, uh, you know, in that in that question was that now comedy needed to be different. You know, there there was a, a new vital role that comedy needed to play needed to play against this existential threat that Donald Trump was. And you know, when you when you have singled out this being as you know that who could possibly you know be you know the the downfall of not only the united states but of the world mm. well now suddenly you have to aim all of your weapons at this person so if it's academia you you need to to, to aim the weapons that you have there if it's if you're uh, the opposite uh, you know political party you need to aim it there if you're a comedian and all you have are punchlines well then that's how you're going to be part of the revolution. That's how you're going to resist. That's how you were going to, you know, uh, go, you know, go behind the ramparts and, and, <laughs> and do that. And um, when you do something like that, you put yourself in a position uh, as a comedian where your only—it's sort of like your only option is to fail. Yeah. You know, like it's yeah. really, it's very, very difficult to be that kind of a warrior when the big part of your job is to make people laugh. Yeah, absolutely. And you deserve to fail as well, I feel. If you are going to, <laughs> instead of making people laugh, which is the surely the comedian's only job, you instead fantasize that you are part of some anti-fascist movement against Trumpism, then you deserve to fall flat on your face. Um, speaking of falling flat on one's face, you talk about some of the um, Saturday Night Live responses to Trump and Trump's conquering of Hillary Clinton and so on. Now, SNL is important to talk about here because it is the comedy institution in the United States, or it was for a period of time, for a long period of time. We don't really get it over here. I mean, I mean that in both terms, we don't get it on our TVs and we don't get it really as comedy because sometimes American comedy doesn't translate brilliantly well in, in the UK. Um, but those two incidents, you, instances you talk about, the first is the infamous one where Kate McKinnon dressed up as Hillary Clinton in a white pantsuit and sang the Leonard Cohen song, Alleluia. And there was no punchline. It was just this soppy, weeping, ode to Hillary. And uh, it was just an extraordinary thing to behold. And then, of course, there was the time they sang to Sir with Love to Obama, which was particularly creepy because, of course, that comes from the Sidney Poitier film in the 60s, where he's the black school teacher and the school kids, including Lulu, recognize that he's a wonderful teacher, a wonderful guy. It had this really creepy, paternalistic, racial undertone, as well as just not being particularly funny. So when SNL is doing stuff like that, where they don't even try with the punchline, and it really is just making a political comment about the evilness of Trump and the wonderfulness of Obama, that really speaks to an exhaustion of mainstream comedy, don't you think? You know what's so funny is you're describing those two incidents and I wrote about those two incidents and I can't believe they actually happened. <laughs> you know, here you are, you're describing a, like you said, a comedy institution mm -hmm. that's been around for decades that has launched 
not only the careers of so many comedians, but changed comedy, you know, in the same way that Monty Python has mm-hmm. changed comedy and comedy would never be the same. SNL has done that, you know, over, you know, over the decades. And I can't believe that they did that. I really can't believe. And it's troubling. You, you know, you wonder who are you speaking to mm-hmm. when, when you do, when you do a performance like that, what do you, what do you expect to happen from that? Like what, you know, and my mind is still blown by that. And I, and I think uh, something's happened too with SNL where I think so many people have turned against the show yeah. for things like that, that people aren't even willing to admit when they get it right and do a really good sketch. Yeah, And I think that that's something that that's upsetting too, because there are a lot of talented people who work on SNL, either in front of the camera or behind the camera. And, you know, a lot of people, that is where their, uh, their careers are. And you're wondering, you know, what is, you know, what does the future look like for that, you know, for that show? And if people will ever, if SNL will ever get it back and if people will, will ever forgive their, uh, their comedy sins or their non-comedy sins. It's a hard time out there financially for many people right now, which is why we at Spiked are more grateful than ever for the support of our generous readers. Spiked is completely free to read, and yet you still hand over your hard-earned cash to fund our pro-freedom, pro-democracy journalism. This helps us to continue growing and to reach more and more people. Over the next few weeks, we're doing a donation drive to fortify us for the months ahead. So to those who can afford it, please do consider digging deep. For a limited time only, we also have a special offer. Those who donate £50 or more will receive a free signed copy of Joanna Williams' brilliant new book, How Woke Won. Plus, you'll get a whole year's access to Spiked Supporters, our donor community where you can access exclusive events and other perks. To make a donation, go to www.spiked.com hyphen online.com slash donate. That's www.spite hyphen online.com slash donate. On the issue of Trump and what happened to comedy in the US under Trump, you talked there about that question that people were actually asking, which is what is the role of comedy in the Trump era? Uh, You know, this taking themselves absurdly seriously as these kind of political figures almost. But isn't one of the problems, you you touch on this in your book, one of the problems is surely that in the cultural establishment, at least in the US and also in the cultural establishment here, being anti-Trump was the safest, most conformist thing you could be. I mean, it was, there was an extraordinary level of agreement in cultural elites or the coastal elites or however we want to refer to them, the woke establishment. I don't know what words we're supposed to use these days. Uh, There was an extraordinary amount of agreement that Trump was a really deeply problematic person, possibly a reincarnation of Hitler, evil personified. People who voted for him were dumb rednecks and people who don't understand the importance of um, equality and, and freedom and so on. And so in that kind of space, people are actually all thinking in the same way, often performing quite similarly too, in terms of uh, where they're aiming their comedy punches. And so it's understandable, isn't it, in that context that some people did switch off and think, well, I'm hearing this all the time. It's not new. It's not fresh. It's the same stuff. And so the problem, I think, for comedy in the US is that it became really predictable in that moment. You just knew what every mainstream comedian pretty much was going to say when they went on stage and started talking about Trump, there was never really any surprise. Yeah. I think you hit the nail right on the head. And a big part of comedy is surprise Mm. is doing the unexpected. And when you're a, you know, a regular person who, you know, isn't getting up at the clubs or in a writer's room and you already know what the punchline's going to be, man, yeah, man, that really sucks. But I think uh, one of the great things about that time is that it really opened up so much material for independent comedians to do their thing. So independent comedians like myself. So in a way I was saying like, look, here's this huge, you know, uh, target, you know, this spray tan target, this orange man bed, go for it. Spend all your time taking apart this 
corpse of a punchline mm. uh, or, you know, this setup, whatever, go for it. I'm going to be looking for other uh, subject matter uh, to make fun of and build an audience on that. And one of the sketches that, that I produced for when I was with uh, We the Internet TV is a sketch called Stop Making Me Defend Donald yeah. Trump. Yeah. And it's basically a guy who he didn't vote for Trump. He doesn't like the man, but he's tired of all these conversations he's hearing where either there are out, outright lies being told about the guy or, you know, people, you know, just not getting uh, his policies correct. And he feeling the need that he has to come and, you know, uh, correct the record. And uh, of course, you know, him being, you know, lambasted uh, for that. And what was really cool about that sketch, and a lot of times you don't know how a sketch is going to do when you put it out, is the amount of people who reached out and said, dude, that is my life. Yeah. I can't stand this guy, <laughs> but what I also can't stand are people who have to go out of their way and make stuff up about him. I thought that was really cool. Like here we have an opportunity where the subject matter is Trump, right? Uh, to a degree, but it was, a but we were able to speak to a completely different crowd, a crowd who's, you know, who wants to tell it like it is and is more interested in, in truth. And we were able to make them laugh. And I yeah. thought that was cool. And, and throughout, you know, I, I think the opportunity is always there in comedy to do things like that. Yeah, I agree. And those opportunities do still exist. And and we, the internet, which you were involved in for a period of time was very good at that and poking holes in some of the new ideologies, I guess, including one that I want to talk to you about now, which is wokeness. Now, woke is a strange word in, in many ways because it means different things to different people. And in some people's eyes, it is a positive thing to be woke. It means being socially aware, being aware of racial injustice and so on, while in other people's eyes, and you make it pretty clear in chapter 18 of your book that when you use the term woke, you are always using it in the pejorative sense, which is how I use it too. Woke <laughs> in the sense of being overly politically correct, pretty stiff, obsessed with policing language, and obsessed with issues of race in a very problematic way. And I want to dig into that issue with you as well. Um, so on the issue of wokeness, let's talk about the threat that that potentially poses to comedy. And it would be difficult to talk about this without bringing in Dave Chappelle, one of the greats who finds himself getting into trouble fairly frequently these days for criticizing the politics of transgenderism in particular. There have been protests outside Netflix head, headquarters for, for airing his specials in which he has made comments about uh, trans women. Do you think we're arriving at a situation where there is such a heightened level of sensitivity and such a desire to control language that might be deemed offensive by any community that comedy almost becomes impossible because you become so obsessed with thinking about saying the right thing and not being problematic that you lose sight of your key task, which is to write some funny jokes. I think there's definitely a fear there for, for a lot of people. And I mean, even look at, uh, you know, going, uh, you know, back a little ways to the Oscars where, you know, Chris Rock mm. was smacked, mm. where Will Smith got up and smacked him on stage. I know for, you know, there were a lot of people thinking like, oh my God, is this what comedy is going to be like. This is what comedians are going to have to deal with. They're going to yeah. be at a club. They're going to say a joke. And then now someone feels, you know, empowered to get up on stage and actually hit them. And, you know, you know, people were scared about that for a little while. And then talk about Dave Chappelle. Dave Chappelle was on stage in California. Some guy got up on stage, tried to tackle him. And that guy was, uh, as they say, uh, folded up. Yeah. And uh, he got, you know, he really got the uh, the bad end of <laughs> trying to mess with a comedian who has a a very uh, big, strong fan base and and posse around mm -hmm. him. So I'm happy that that we have. I think we've gotten through what I think is the uh, the fear of physical altercation for comedians. You know, so that that's something for sure. As far as you know, being worried about which you know topics you can you can take on. I think I think there's definitely going to be a lot of people who are comedians who are scared to do that. And then I think it just opens up, you know, sort of it's like a market opportunity for, okay, well, then you have all these other comedians who don't fear it and who are willing to speak up. And, 
you know, I think the audiences will kind of uh, sort themselves out. Yeah. Um, I think more than anything, I wish that we could at least get back to a time where if you were offended by a joke, if you were offended by the mere presence of a comedian, you don't go and check them out. And, you know, to even further than that, you don't try to make sure that no one is ever allowed to go and see them again. Mm -hmm. I think if we can get back to that, I think that would be a really good thing for comedy overall. We hear a lot today about democracy, the belief that the people should always have the final say in how they are governed. But where did that idea come from? I've been watching Athenian Democracy, an experiment for the ages on Wondrium to find out more about the history of democracy. 24 fascinating episodes show how democracy first came about, the transformative effect it had on ancient Greece, and why this one bold idea has come to shape the world we live in today. Wondrium gives you unlimited access to thousands of hours of audio and video courses, documentaries, tutorials, and more. You can learn wherever and whenever works for you from top university professors and experts in their fields, all without the pressure of homework or exams, just the best parts of learning. Unlock this world of knowledge for yourself. Sign up for Wondrium today and take advantage of this great offer. Wondrium is offering my listeners a free month of unlimited access. To get this offer, visit our special URL, wondrium.com slash Brendan. That's W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M dot com slash Brendan. In relation to that, one of the points you make in the book, which I think is so important and you make it in really incredibly clearly, is the broader consequences of cancel culture. So you make the point that, you know, we hear about the big headline famous people who have been threatened with cancellation. So we hear about the Dave Chappelle's, we hear about the JK Rowling's, obviously she's not a comedian, but she's the target of a lot of woke harassment. And the point that lots of woke agitators will often make is, well, look, these people haven't been canceled. And in fact, they often thrive off the idea that they are targets for cancellation. And, you know, they will say, look, they don't like us, they want to punish us, and yet they still have their huge platforms. Chappelle is still on Netflix, JK Rowling still sells millions and millions of books. But the point you make is that there is this trickle-down effect of cancel culture, where you have these showy spectacles of people being demonized and called out, to use their their words, uh, for saying incorrect things. And that, that has a knock-on effect, doesn't it, across society where there will be people who perhaps don't have the clout of someone like Dave Chappelle, who will think to themselves, well, maybe I shouldn't say the thing I was going to say. Maybe I shouldn't express that controversial idea that lurks in the back of my mind. So there's a chilling effect across society, isn't there? And I've often thought that that probably there's no way of us measuring this really, but that probably is quite pronounced in the comedy world. And if if you're an up and coming comedian who doesn't want to be canceled and you see even someone like Dave Chappelle getting it in the neck, there is going to be an element of self-policing in response, isn't there? Uh, for sure, for sure. And, and also it sets up this, I don't know, uh, an unspoken rule where, oh, if you're wealthy and successful, then you can be honest. Yeah. You need to reach this level where, you know, you have, you know, fuck you money, <laughs> and then you get to tell the world what you really think. And, you know, not only is that, I guess, I guess it's classist, you know, to be able, uh, you know, to, to say that for sure, but it's also, you know, you know, we live in a time where uh, what's so important is, uh, quote unquote, your truth mm. and being who you are. And you really can't be who you are if you're if you're unable to express what you believe what you know what your what your opinions are or at least being willing to uh you know have a conversation about about the stuff you know so many conversations are shut down before they even begin mm -hmm. because of uh because of things like this because I'll, like you said you know with the chilling effect there uh it's hard to it's easy to measure how many times um, a venue refused to uh, allow Dave Chappelle to perform mm. not, not too long ago. It was a, a venue in, in Detroit uh, that uh, was made famous. I think it was First Avenue uh, because Prince performed there. Uh, it's very easy to you know count those numbers, but what's what's not easy is all the places that will never book a comedian to begin with because of uh, you know because of blowback. 
On Chappelle, I wanted to ask you about punching up and punching down. You touch on this in the book as well. I find these to be such fascinating terms. Firstly, because I'd always assumed that a comedian's job was to punch up, down, left, right, anywhere that they want, so long as they're being funny. It, it, it shouldn't really matter if they're punching a powerful target or a not so powerful target. But the thing that I've always thought, and I wanted to see what you thought of this, is I see Dave Chappelle when he talks about the trans issue as just one example. I see that as punching up, not because I think trans people are very powerful. They are a marginalized community. They do have certain problems that obviously we need to talk about and we need to address. But the institutionalization of the trans ideology as something that you are not allowed to criticize, as something that you have to just repeat as a mantra, trans women are women, trans women are women, all of that does suggest that it has this aura almost of a new religious belief system amongst the kind of correct thinking elites or the establishments and so on. That seems to me to be, if, if we were to talk about comedy having to pick targets that are pretty big and pretty powerful, that seems to me to be a legitimate one. But I, I wanted to ask you just to spell out what you think about the punching up, punching down discussion and whether you think it's legitimate even to ask that question of where a comedian's punches are going. In the book, I, you know, I, I take on a lot of, I guess, comedy rules and uh, that one being it, you know, I often hear, you yeah. know, the whole, the whole punching up thing. And uh, I think that kind of goes hand in hand with like the speaking truth to power. Mm. And uh, something that I found with the, with the speaking truth to power thing is like, you know, when did we add the power component to it <laughs> yeah. uh, as opposed to just speaking truth? Mm. Right. And I think if what you're looking to do is to speak the truth or the world as you see it, well, then it's going to, you know, sometimes you're going to take on subjects that are the downtrodden mm. or people who are protected classes. And I think that it's the job, but also it's a part of the trade to be willing to go down those roads and, and see, you know, and see what happens. And with, uh, with Chappelle, I mean, something that, 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 that I, find, I, th I think Chappelle is, is, you know, just a, such a perfect, example of the times that that we're living in where i remember uh you know reading so many headlines about his special the closer uh in particular the you know so-called transphobia mm -hmm. uh, uh you know th that that he was uh you know preaching i guess or however you want to call it you know so many so many headlines and you know i'm, I'm a busy guy i i work full time i have a family uh, Any time that I get to myself, uh, it's often just trying to get a few winks of sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, I have two. I have a two-year-old and a and a and a ten-month-old. You know, I wasn't planning on watching the special, but I said, you know what? I think I have to watch this because the way that it's being portrayed in the media, something just smells off. Yeah. So I watched the closer, and you know, no, you know, spoilers. My apologies. He ends that special by telling a story about a dear friend of his who is a trans woman named Daphne who committed suicide, hmm. right? And this is a comedy special. And as I say in the book, you know, sometimes, you know, when comedy takes on some of the darkest examples of humanity and it works, it's like magic. And I think what Dave Chappelle did in this bit is magical hmm. because it's a, he went to a very dark place talking about a friend of his and he made it really funny. And I felt like when I was watching that, not only was I watching a master craftsman, a master of his trade, but I was watching sort of humanity and comedy and everything, you know, coming together. And that's something that I think is missing from so much of this commentary. It all comes down to how do we politicize this as opposed to let's look at the, the creative magic that's being done here. And and that's something that, that I found uh, that I think was lacking in, in in a lot of the conversations about the closer and about comedy in general. That's very well put. And on that issue of creative magic and how things come together, which is so often killed by over analysis and killed by problematization and, and those other attacks that are being launched on culture more broadly. I wanted to talk to you about one of my favorite 
chapters in your book, which is called Black Cartoons, Black Voices. And this is something you've written about on Spiked as well, yep. which is about the two pretty prominent scandals in which cartoon characters were either cancelled or, or reimagined because there was apparently a disconnect between the actor and the unreal animated character that they were playing. So Mike Henry uh, stopped voicing Cleveland Brown on Family Guy because Mike Henry is not black and Cleveland Brown is black. And apparently that was problematic. Uh, I think he said only persons of color should play characters of color, which is such a 2020 sentence. I mean, it is just perfect. And then of course, there's the even more famous example of Apu in The Simpsons, uh, who was voiced for a very long time by Hank Azaria. And uh, Apu is just seen as generally problematic because he's seen as a uh, South Asian stereotype, a racist stereotype. There was a documentary, The Problem with Apu. Apu's always been one of my favorite characters. I just love the one of my favorite facts about Apu is that he graduated first in his class of 7 million students at the, <laughs> at the Calcutta <laughs> Institute of Technology. I mean, that is that is just some funny stuff. And, and Apu was always one of my favorite characters in The Simpsons. So t talk us through those two things and, and, and how you see those as being weird and strange and not conducive to the kind of creative magic you were just talking about. Well, yeah, I think, I think one of the, uh, you know, the magical elements of voiceover is that you could have somebody who looks nothing like the character, yeah. but yet <laughs> sounds so perfect, you know? So taking that Cleveland character, you know, here you have a, here you have a, an example of a, a white guy who created this voice, who created, you know, the, the tone and, and all that of this character, who then decides that he needs to wave bye bye to the character. And then what do they do? Well, they they hire a young man who is of color to do the exact same <laughs> voice, you know, and, and really? this guy, um, he's a, a, I think he got started on on YouTube and he's a really talented guy. Mm. I, I forget his name. My, my apologies. Uh, but the reason why he was hired is because he's able to do the Cleveland <laughs> voice that was invented by the white actor. Yeah. You know, so there's something there that that is just um, that's just so ridiculous. Yeah. And then you know, then there's the element of you know, you wonder like, what century are we in? Now we have you know some kind of cartoon version of the one drop rule, where <laughs> somehow if if this <laughs> if you know this character is uh is you know, this fictional character is half black and half white, but because they're half black, they are fully black, you know? And uh, now my mind is going to, you know, just imagine when, how cartoons, you know, sometimes were hand drawn. So maybe the colors are a little lighter than they would be <laughs> computer generated. What is, you know, what does that mean? But it's such a ridiculous, ridiculous time uh, that we're living. And I think I described it as people are, are, are kind of canceling themselves, mm. like preemptively canceling themselves before they can be canceled. It's sort of, you know, their, you know, their opportunity to get a check for 20 years and then step back and say, you know what, I've, I've, I've learned a lot. And if there's anybody out there who I may have harmed, you know, with my, <laughs> with my cartoon character, my apologies, and I'm going to now open the door for, you know, for <laughs> other people. Yeah. And one of your responses, of course, was, to make a mockumentary, I guess, called The Problem with Bumblebee Man, which is obviously gra that character in The Simpsons, obviously gravely offensive to your people, Latinos or Latinx, uh, I suppose we're supposed, <laughs> supposed to say these days. But isn't it the case that some people thought that your mockery of the problem with a poo when you made the problem with um Bumblebee Man, we should explain that Bumblebee Man is a, a character in The Simpsons who is a Latino guy who dresses as a bumblebee. Some people took your comments seriously as a great proud defense of the Latino community against this offensive Simpsons character, the Bumblebee guy. Yeah. And, you know, talk about, you know, being unable to believe that that actually happened. But yeah, it was amazing looking at, you know, we, you, know you post these videos on, on YouTube, on Facebook, where, wherever you can. And yeah, some of the comments in there thought I was serious. <laughs> and, you know, I believe it's still available on, on YouTube. You guys could, uh, can check it out. I mean, there's a scene, <laughs> there's a scene there where I'm meeting, uh, I'm in full B get up and I'm meeting with another, uh, 
guy on the couch who's also in B Get Up, thinking that I'm, I'm meeting with a uh, you know a, a a fellow traveler in here, and it turns out it's just a furry who wants to fuck me. Um, <laughs> but people, but somehow people, you know, still think, oh no, this must be a, a serious thing. And and I think that <laughs> that's happened to me so many times with with other videos too, where people are like, I'm I'm sorry, I can't tell if this is satire or this is real anymore. And, uh, I mean, that's fun for me, you know, being, you know, kind of the, my troll nature. Um, but man, what does that, what does that say <laughs> about where we are, where, you know, things are just so heightened and fantastical where in, in a way you just have to, you know, let, uh, it, it's like what cinema verite, I guess. Yeah. In, in a way. Yes. Well, I wanted to ask you about the extent to which the U S the modern, modern America is, hamstrung by the race question because and this is you talk about the race issue and various aspects of it quite a lot in the book uh you have a brilliant critique of ibram x kendi and that kind of i guess you could call them race grifters people who make a living from policing what we are allowed to think and say about race and even in kendi's situation even talking about whether Black people are allowed to marry white people, whether white people are allowed to adopt black children. I mean, he's raised all these kinds of questions, which would have been seen as racist things to say in the past, but which now are seen as progressive things to say. And you have a chapter on Latinx. Am I saying that right? Latinx is, or is it Latinx? I, 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 th I think it's Latinx. Right. I think so. It's, yeah. It's, uh, but, but, you know, they, I've, I've never, like, like I say in the book, I've never met any Latino no. who <laughs> who identifies as Latinx. So maybe it's, uh, maybe we'll get to a point where it's just a word you're, you're not allowed to pronounce. <laughs> yeah. you know, who knows? <laughs> the unpronounceable. Yeah. And you, so you write about uh, Latinx and you make that point, as you say, that infinitesimally small numbers of Latino people. Uh, use that word. I think it's uh, ninety-seven percent don't use it and think it's bizarre, which of course it is. Um, so you talk a lot about these issues and these questions, and I wanted to ask you how you think this has come about, where the United States has gone from a, a situation where the right thing to do was to think about character rather than color, and the good progressive liberal approach to public life was to not be obsessed over people's racial or cultural heritage and instead to take them as individuals, to treat them as equal individuals who will have good characteristics and bad characteristics like the rest of us do, to a situation now where we are instructed almost to think about race all the time, to think about potential racial antagonisms, to think that white people could never understand black people and Latinx communities need special representations that other communities might not need and so on. How has that situation come about and how destructive do you think that kind of rehabilitation of racial thinking could potentially be? It, I think it's it's incredibly uh, destructive. And um, as, I, as I talk about in the book, there, there was a time where my Latin identity, if you will, was really important to me. Um, my father uh, is from uh, Argentina. Uh, my apologies uh, to the English listeners, hand of God, <laughs> Diego Maradona. My, my <laughs> um, <laughs> he's from uh, Argentina. He, he didn't graduate high school. He came across uh, the border, as many migrants do, and he uh, was a butcher and he built a business and uh, you know raised a family. And he's the type of he's the type of man that uh, I would say a lot of children would be very fortunate to grow up in that kind of a household. And for a long time, my father was my hero. So I sort of uh, wrapped myself in his identity, hmm. right? You know, the, you know, kind of proud, hardworking immigrant story, uh, you know, fighting against the odds and all that. And, you know, at some point you need to make your own way in the world. And what I found was that the part of my identity that was so different, I think, from, you know, from other people and made me so, so much more individualistic was that I'm a comedian. So that's sort of how I uh, sort of broke away from these immutable characteristics. You know, I have no choice on who my father was yeah. or, or, or what my DNA test says, mm. but I do have a choice on my writing and, and the subjects that I take and every time that I, that, I, that I hit the stage. So 
I, I, I don't know what it is if it's sort of a a lack of character that so many people have now where all they have to hold on to are these immutable characteristics mm -hmm. where you know if you say what are the most important things about you they would put their race or their ethnicity and all that at the top as opposed to you know how are they as are they good friends are they a great partner are they a husband are they a, a wife you know et cetera, et cetera. and um and i feel like obviously you know that's become a currency you know because uh in the past you know we might say like dude i don't give a fuck what you are mm -hmm. like if you're not a good person you're not a good person now it's i care about what you are and here are all these um these handouts that you can have uh, i talk about in one of the chapters about uh in academia all of these white women who pretend to be women of color yeah yeah and it's it's astonishing like they're, they're all like phds and all that and it's like <laughs> well well obviously in that in that segment of society in that world it is a boon yeah. to be a a, a person of, of color you know you are granted jobs and scholarships and, and all that um so i think that there are a lot of people who are you know going that way because it's uh because th there's something in it for them for yeah. sure yeah and uh, that section on on Rachel Dolezal and and those academics as well that you mentioned, white women pretending to be non-white women is is really really good, very good part of the book. It's interesting you use the word currency there. I think that's really accurate. And there's another form of currency too, which is to be a victim, and particularly to have been a victim of violence. Now, some people are not lucky enough to have been a victim of violence, so they have to pretend that they were. And uh, you have a chapter in there on hate crime fiction, hate crime myths, hate crime hoaxes, I guess, uh, with our friend Jussie Smollett, who is the actor who infamously set up his own racist attack by two black guys <laughs> who pretended to be uh, Trump supporters, and uh, people will know the story. And you talk about how, you know, we have a situation now where a wealthy actor doing, who was doing quite well in his career has to stage his own hate crime. That's how good race relations in America really are behind all the kind of crap that is talked about by uh, the, the new race grifters. Just talk to us a bit about, the, because like the uh, white women in academia, there are now quite a few cases of hate crime hoaxes. Jussie Smollett's, Smollett's is the best known, but there have been other examples on campuses in particular where people claim to have been attacked because of their race and it's turned out not to be true. What do you think is motoring that kind of delusional, fictional idea of oneself as a victim of violence to such an extent you just have to completely stage it? I, I think it, it's definitely a, a good opportunity to uh, point out one of uh, a contributor to Spiked, Wilfred Riley mm. has a great book about hate crime hoaxes uh, that in that chapter that you described actually uh, talked about uh, one that he goes into uh, in the book. And, you know, I think that it I think that it it is very telling of the times that we're living in where if somebody was a victim of a hate crime, damn near everybody would say that's oh, my God, that's awful. Mm -hmm. But that that is terrible. We need to get to the bottom of this. We need to protect the we need to protect this person. You know, it, it, one thing that with with Jesse Smollett, I mean, there's quite a bit in that story that I think we should be very proud of. You know, the, <laughs> it was evidence that we went one day in the United States without a gay black man being beaten <laughs> up by white Trump supporting racists. Like, come on, we, <laughs> we, we, we've made it. We, we've made it so far. And in his head, in his mind, uh, he is still the victim. I mean, he yeah. is committed to that role yeah. like like no other uh so there, there you know there's a lot to be applauded there and you know i think you know i think like like you say like you know uh it's it really is wonderful not to be a real victim of a crime nobody wants to be abused nobody wants to be beaten um so if there's a way for you to get all of the attention, the sympathy, the compassion, without actually having to go through a uh, a traumatic experience, well, there are people out there who are willing to go for it and willing to, uh, you know, write their script and and stage it and, and do all that. Real commitment there to the role that these people are showing. And my favorite part of the Jussie Smollett story 
is the body cam footage from the police where Smollett is back in his apartment wearing a very fetching cardigan and still wearing the noose that was apparently put around his neck, left on for display. It is just too perfect. Just sticking with the race issue for a moment longer, there is also the problem of white men, which you talk about, (laughs) the terrible problem of white men. You talk about the problematic (laughs) transition of Ellen Page into Elliot Page, which is just what the world needs, another white man. Who would want to become a white man in this era? That is the question. But what do you make of anti-whiteness? Now, of course, you know, nobody wants to go down the kind of infantile alt-right route of saying the real victims in modern society are white men. They just can't catch a break. But there is obviously an anti-whiteness in woke discussions, academic discussions, uh, certain parts of the media. Uh, and you yourself have have been scandalously referred to as being far right adjacent because of the critical comedy that you do on online, which by the way, is not even remotely far right. It's so hilarious. What do you make of that kind of, uh, this almost instantaneous problematization of white men that takes place the, these days? And this as- assumption often that there is something suspect about them politically. I mean, you know, we're at the point now where as I talk about in my in my book, there was an example of a of a hate crime that was uh, perpetrated by a a black male against an Asian person mm. in an amazing um, I believe is a bishop of of uh, of some sort Bishop Swan I believe his name was. <laughs> he said even when a black person attacks an Asian person, the encounter is fueled very specially by white supremacy. White supremacy does not require a white person to perpetuate it. These are <laughs> these are things that people are putting out there mm. on their Instagram and everybody is supposed to like shake their you know shake their head uh, about <laughs> it i don't know if it if it's like we're just so good at imagining things now we're so creative and just making stuff up we're you know uh the movie avatar was just such a uh, a crowning achievement in special <laughs> effects and ever since then we can just imagine anything uh anything into the world i think when it comes to you know the the target of you know white men and whiteness i think what, what it really is that there are a lot of people out there who would love to take out their aggression and would love to you know be able to tell somebody to go to hell and they're very upset with their lives and where they are but there are rules in society about who you can do that to Mm. you know and it turns out that white men are a target that you are freely allowed to to mock and and to go after and going back to to uh to chappelle I feel like there are there are a lot of people who a lot of white people in particular who are kind of like saving up all of their uh, checked white privilege and they're just so happy that you know since Chappelle was you know dipping his toe into the the trans fear they're like yes now he is a he is a target I am allowed <laughs> to mock this man now thank God you know and I and I I, I don't know I think that there might be a uh, you know a lack of character on a lot of people. And, and that's where the, where the target is. Okay, a couple more questions for you, Lou. I want sure. to ask you what it's like being a libertarian comedian and what that entails. Now, I should say that your book, uh, which people should read, contains all that good stuff we've just been talking about in terms of commentary on issues and comedy and culture, but also it's got a lot of your story in it as well in terms of what it's like to be a comedian, what that involves, the slog it often involves. And you talk about being a libertarian comedian, which I guess is pretty rare in the US, certainly in the mainstream of comedy, you wouldn't see that many. So what does that entail? What is it like being a libertarian comedian? What is what is the response that you get from other comedians? Are they bamboozled? Are they just uh, confused that such a person would exist? What What is that like for you? Uh, well, being a libertarian comedian means that I'm often performing for audiences who are armed. Uh, that that's that's definitely a part of it. I, if if uh, you your uh, listeners are familiar with the Free State Project, uh, but my good friend Carla uh, Carla Garrick, she uh, got me uh, in, involved with them, and I often uh, will go up to New Hampshire uh, to perform. And I brought a couple of uh, uh, other comedians uh, with me who aren't libertarians, and um, after the show an audience member tipped 
one of the other comedians in Bitcoin. And the whole time he had a, a gun holstered on his side. So it's sort of like the, <laughs> to give you an, a, you know, an image of, uh, of what it's like. I, I got to say, I, I've, I was a comedian uh, first. I started doing comedy in college before I was uh, even knew what a libertarian was. And uh, if you know libertarians, libertarians have all different ideas about what a real libertarian is. Yep. But I was, I was doing uh, comedy before um, I got into you know, the, political, uh, uh, the political side of it. And, you know, something that I've uh, been fortunate of is to have libertarian audiences who are willing to come out and see me perform and to, and to uh, support my work. And it sort of kind of comes back to why I'm so hopeful for the future, because I, I look around and I'm like, wow, there are, you know, so many people who like what I'm doing and don't ask me to censor myself, mm. who are happy that I'm out here doing what I'm doing, and they're willing to support me. Man, that's fantastic. And I think I think there are so many opportunities there to cultivate an audience, to build that, you know, to build that audience and to show them the respect that they deserve too, that you're gonna try to bring your A game as much as you can to them. And in that relationship that we have the opportunity to to forge, I think that's where uh I don't know, the, the future looks good. Yeah. So that was gonna be my final question for you, which is about the future. And we touched on this earlier and the fact that there are, the irony, I guess, of the times we live in is that the internet has helped to make it much easier to cancel people, to spread lies about them being racist or problematic or deserving of punishment. There's the Twitter mob phenomenon and all sorts of really problematic uses of the internet to punish misthinkers and misspeakers. But at the same time, the internet opens up a whole new possibility for comedians and other creatives who want to circumvent uh, the old mainstream system and do their own thing. You've done that. Uh, you did that with We The Internet. You've done it in other ways as well. There are people like Ryan Long, for example, who is a comedian who is distinctly not woke and who puts his own stuff out online. And then even in the comedy establishment, there are some pretty heroic figures. You know, our mutual friend, Noam Dwarman, who uh, runs the Comedy Cellar in New York, who is a pretty brave guy in terms of still being willing to give a space to people on the basis of whether they're funny and whether they've got something funny to say rather than whether they tick all the correct boxes. So it, we shouldn't be too down, should we? Because technology and old spaces in which the owners are willing to take a risk, those things exist and they do create the space for people to push back against all the stuff you and I have been talking about and which you write about in your book. You said it better than I <laughs> than I could say it. Uh, yeah, I'm 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 very hopeful about that, and I think it's also, you know, in a way, looking at you know what you yourself are are capable of. And um, I don't think that I could change the world, but I do know uh, from my experience that there are times when I've taken the stage, and there's been a a silent audience, and I've spoken into the mic, and I made that audience laugh. And that's a pretty, it's a pretty amazing thing to be able to do that and to have the opportunity to do that. And I'm hoping that, you know, I can keep doing that. And I hope that, you know, anybody who, you know, who purchases my book, I hope you have a lot of moments like that, uh, reading it. Lou Perez, thank you very much. Thank you.